What's your writing process? Do you sometimes have periods when you need to unlock your creativity? Well, today we have a visit from Craig Kittner from Ghosts on Vacay. And it could just be that what he's going to say and what his website can offer you will help you become a better writer. Do let us know what you think. Hello, my name is Patricia, and this is the Poetry P podcast. As I said, today we have a visit from Craig Kittner, and I think what he has to offer you will be useful whether you write haiku, any other form of poetry, or even prose. And there is a video of this conversation available on Poetry P on our YouTube channel. If you nip over there, why not subscribe? It's free. And you can write some haiku and senryu for the video prompt. You can leave as many poems as you like in the comments section for Linda, our prompt editor, to read. And you may get featured on another podcast and in the Poetry P Journal. Speaking of which, many of you contributed to the creation of the latest one. And I'm happy to tell you that it's available now and the link is just one of the many reasons you should nip over and have a look at the show notes on Poetry P. And while you're at the website, perhaps you can check in on the submissions calendar, see what we're reading at the moment. If you're in real time, March 2024, then we're accepting submissions of Taria Vaza Haiku until the 15th of March. And then from the 16th to the end of the month, you should be sending us Haibun. What fun! Our merry band of members is growing. But if you're not one of them, would you think of sponsoring the podcast and keep it going? Join up. There are a variety of memberships to choose from and you can always buy the podcast a coffee. Details in the show notes. Thank you very much. Lastly, and really not least, are you on the mailing list? Because I'm going to be sending out some very, very exciting news soon. Something for you poets to take part in. But it will only be for those of you on the mailing list. So don't miss out. Do sign up. Okay, that's enough about me. Come along into P Towers and join Craig and I for a chat. And when we've finished, don't forget to go over to his website, have a look at what he's offering, try it, and let Craig know what you think. Hope you enjoy it. I did. Craig and I met up at Haiku North America, the conference last year in Cincinnati, and he told me about a new project he was working on, Ghosts on Vacay. Now, Craig, you might well pronounce your name differently, I know, and um, you may well pronounce this differently, but you, you'll get a chance to tell us in a second. But either way, we both thought this would be an interesting topic for a podcast. And so it's taken us a while, which is mostly my fault, but he's here at last and we're going to hear about Ghosts on Vacay. And I'm going to put Craig's website on the show notes if you want to check it out later. And I suggest it, that you should because it's very interesting. So a huge Poetry P welcome to a fellow Harry Potter fan, Craig Kittner. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I have always loved the way you say my name. And I, I figure since <laughs> my name, the source of it, I believe is uh, uh, possibly Scottish, maybe okay. English, I'm not sure. But uh, I always felt the way you say my name sounds right to me. <laughs> so I appreciate you. it. I always feel that Craig should be a Scottish name somehow. Mm. Yeah. No. Dweller of the Crag is what I figured out, <laughs> the original. <laughs> I think you could be right there. Which works well for a haiku poet. <laughs> <laughs> More of that later. Yes. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to say something no, about sorry. North America. Well, yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out that, uh, so last summer uh, for me, that was, I hit a lot of milestones last summer. And mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where all this came from. Uh, you know, um, last summer I, I hit about 30 years of uh, the act of creating things and putting it in front of people and working with creative communities. Um, I hit 10 years of my current job where I'm a customer service manager and I lead a team and 
uh, you know, that's all about training people on how to speak, what to speak about. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it hit my seventh year of writing haiku, officially. Um, but, you know, my journey through uh, the world of creation actually began with painting uh, and drawing. And uh, I spent several years in Washington, D.C., uh, exhibiting in galleries and running galleries and, and teaching artists. Uh, but when we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina in 2012, soon after that, the artwork went away. Um, can't say exactly why, but uh, writing became much more important to me all of a sudden. And so then I began writing haiku in 2016. And, and the reason why I started with the haiku is I, it filled a need that I used to fill with sketching. And the need was just to, uh, to observe and then lose myself in the observation. And that's what I was kind of missing from that visual. And that's what Haiku started to give me back. And at the time, I didn't even realize that Shiki had the whole you know, idea of a, a Haiku sketch you know, or the approach of Haiku like sketching. Um, but you know, as the conference approached, I, I realized I wanted to offer something to my community that uh, that was new and different and something that would incorporate you know the experience I gathered um, most of my education in the arts has been self-education and my education in haiku has been a lot of self-exploration and, and education so guided by Basho you know I asked myself how could I present an approach that would uh, cut through the complexities that western style education often puts in front of things um and and something that would foster a mindset that i think is really crucial to to the to the gathering and writing of authentic haiku um and when i say authentic haiku i mean something that's authentic to the experience that inspired it um so that's where the framework of ghost on vacay started to come together and i wanted an approach that would work equally well regardless of your experience with haiku. If you've never written a haiku before, it would work. If you're a deeply experienced haiku writer, then it helped generate beginner's mind in you and, and uh, can can be a very useful thing to, if complexities have you know, come into your head and are blocking you or, or you just want a new way to go about it. So um, with that then, with Ghost on Vacay, I, I came up with the concept of these haiku creation kits. And the haiku creation kit uh, idea is that you can go out to write a haiku and you can turn your brain off completely. You don't have to think about it. You can just follow the steps I lay it out to guide you to this to this experience and then let the experience take over and and, and get to the end point of having something written down. Um, and there was a certain spirit that drove this. And I want to kind of lay out what that was. Um, there's something that's not a thing, but it's always present and it has no substance, but it's the source of everything that does. And we tend to be unaware of it or attempt to capture it in concepts, but no words are capable of putting it in a box. And when your mind is clear and your perceptions open, you can experience it directly through what's happening around and through you. And haiku is full of it but that's nothing special. Everything is. What is special is that haiku can convey it directly. Haiku is free of demands for commentary and interpretations. Haiku is just as it is. So to experience haiku is to enter a state that's open and perceptive, a quiet mind that can hear. And there are practical everyday steps you can take to encourage this mind within yourself through the practice of a haiku. When your intention is focused on these steps, it's relatively easy to quiet your thoughts. Your indoctrination, your doubts, and everything that haunts your head can go away, and it makes writing haiku a much more, but those things make writing haiku a much more complicated thing than it needs to be. So in other words, you can send your ghosts on vacation while you get on with the business of experiencing your world through the natural unfolding of life, and that is the essence of what sustains haiku. As I said, the first fruits of that effort were the haiku creation kits. And three of those are going to be currently available on Ghost on Vacay, 
as PDFs that you can download for free and, and experience this. And I certainly would love to get feedback from that from anybody who would like to. And um, the goal behind all of this is to step beyond conceptualizing, get, get past the conceptualizing of things like go to the pine to learn from the pine or you know, to uh, walk in the steps of the of the uh, ancient masters. Um, to, you know, the goal again, to get past that as a concept and to just do it. And um, so the kits again, started this approach and the approach now is currently taking the form of a field guide that I'm working on and we'll be publishing this year. And this was, uh, I actually got a, artist support grant from the North Carolina uh, Council on the Arts uh, to help develop this. And the uh, guide is going to gather in all these things that I feel are conducive to the uh, flowering of the haiku mind, uh, which in a haiku mindset, it's an illuminating thing. It's unshackled and quite frankly, I think it's something that's very much needed in the world. And that is where I'm at. Okay. So now we know where the title Ghost on Vacay came from. Yes. I I heard you, well, we spoke about it at the Haiku North America conference, but it was very interesting to hear you work through the process on a different podcast. How dare you? Um, you were on, let me see, what was it? Fox and... Fox the fox and the fox hound yeah which is how i know you're a fellow harry potter uh, fan <laughs> and you worked through the process there uh and so i would say to people if they want to have a, a sort of uh, work through it with you before they go to your uh your kits or you know if they want to work through it with the kit in hand that's that's quite a hand that was quite a handy podcast to listen to to, to listen to a virgin haiku writer Yes. <laughs> put a, put a haiku together with with the help of one of your kits that was really very interesting and i wrote to you and said i've been thinking about apples ever since <laughs> been able to get out, that out of my mind anyway yes. um so i thought obviously i don't want you to to go through the, all that with me it would be somewhat terrifying to be honest with you um <laughs> but can you talk through your process that maybe the process that you go through with the kits and I, I'm guessing it comes from what you've learned over the seven years, as you said, um, how y you wish someone had had this kit available for you when you were starting out. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, yeah, process. It's an interesting question because about halfway through my uh, haiku writing time. So let's say about three and a half years ago or so, mm -hmm. uh, I came across a concept and quite frankly, I don't even remember where. I got it. But the uh, the idea of to make writing your practice mm -hmm. and practice in the Buddhist sense of, of meditative self-observation. Okay. Um, and that kind of changed things for me a little bit. And mm -hmm. it spent I spent those that time kind of coming to coming to terms with that. Mm -hmm. And so the. For myself, the the kind of base of this is foraging for haiku, uh, which is a term I borrowed from Alan, Alan Summers. Uh, but, you know, the basic concept of a ginkgo walk, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, I believe I'm using the right term there. Yes, um, actually, maybe one, the term is right, but perhaps before we go on, we should explain to the unin uninitiated what yes. you mean about that. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, now, this is often done as a group activity, uh, often around an event, say like the uh, conference, where yeah. you go out just specifically for the purpose of walking around, seeing what's there, and drawing haiku from from the immediate surroundings or, or what you're in. And so for me, uh, the, the foraging idea is you go to a place where you want to gather or for, forage for haiku. You spend some time before doing anything else just centering yourself there and just you know feeling what's all around you and then in a process that's similar to meditation you you consciously bring your attention to what's going on around you 
And then when thoughts occur, which they're going to, and you can't, well, you can, but, you know, trying to just stop thought is, is a really difficult thing. And I don't, I don't suggest it, but what you can do is when a thought appears, as you're doing this, you look at the thought, just like you look at, say, a bird singing or, or a squirrel running across the branch or a cloud covering up the sun. It's just an event like any other. And you can note it just like you would an event going on around you and bring your attention back to what's going around mm -hmm. or going on around you now though some of those thoughts might actually end up being in your haiku but they're going to be in there not as again interpretation or parroting something that some idea or feeling that somebody else has done uh they're going to be simply your observation of what passed through your head as as uh as as you did the gathering so i do this on a regular basis and then it becomes practice for other times, say when I'm driving to work or I'm walking across the uh, the room to go get a cup of coffee, I can, because I practice with this, I can at any time turn that on and then get nice surprise haiku that, you know, uh, that I didn't know. And plus it just has the extra benefit of being a great way to just experience your life and, and your life, your individual life, not the group life that's going on all around you so so i would say that yes that's my that's my process i have dedicated time out to just gather whatever's there and then be ready to turn it on when, when i need it and then the process later is is revision when it's time to you know to be quiet and to think about getting the what i've gathered up out into the world and uh prepare it for you know submission and that kind of I that's that's interesting. So you've made a, a couple of points there that I wanted to come back on. You I think you said this in your foraging, you note down your your thoughts, your interpretation of what you're seeing. And then you come back and in the and, and do the writing and revision process. When you say interpretation, it brings me sort of onto the question of haiku form. Interpretation is is a word that may be a little bit dangerous because <laughs> my way of thinking, and you, as I said, you may disagree with me, is that we don't necessarily interpret. We are much more objective in a haiku. Um, so we're putting down things that actually would happen maybe in a weird and wonderful way, but people will always be able to say, okay, that I can see the reality in that mm. uh, haiku. What do you think? What is that what you mean that, you, you know, you're looking at something, you're going to write that down in your haiku. It's going to be objective, but it might not, it might, you know, you might twist the words around slightly. You might have a slightly different take on it, a different spin, but ultimately it will be quite an objective interpretation of what you've seen yes that's i guess when i use the term interpretation what what i'm really getting at is again the experience that led to that that was the source of the haiku mm -hmm. or that it you know forms the basis of this is the subject this is what i'm writing about is okay. this experience again that's a wordless experience that's that's an experience that ha that takes place up here and if we're not careful it gets all bound up and 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 tied into again what we've learned already what we um what we bring to it and th and this kind of is is kind of the key thing when any anytime we're in in the environment and we're trying to gather up haiku uh experiences um we're bringing to it already we have our personality our our experience what what a um uh, uh one haiku writing book uh that i read said talked about a funded experience okay, okay. and that is really going to impact what out of 
the thousands of things that are going on around you and the thousands of haiku that are there to be written, you're going to be drawn to the thing that has a connection for you. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's an authenticity there. Mm -hmm. There's an authenticity because this event is going on. This event that's going on is I'm seeing a snapshot of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if I see a bird on the branch and I want to write about that bird, well, that bird's life is going on well before I ever get there and will continue to going on after I'm gone. I am peeking in on a, you know, an unfolding event. Mm -hmm. But I'm drawn to it because... There's something there that catches my attention. So the interpretation part really is how do I take that event that has authenticity because I was drawn to it and not add on to it a bunch of other stuff okay. that, that again, I already know. And this is all about learning, like I said, learning from the pines and, and, and walk, walking the steps. Mm -hmm. Um so anything I add to that is just really kind of confusing the issue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So then I have something that has meaning to me, but I don't interpret it. I, I don't, you know, and I don't add to it. I just simply pretty much record it, interpret it from mm -hmm. a wordless experience into words. And then those words will go out and someone reading the haiku, if they have, again, the same kind of approach to reading as we do to writing, they will have a meaning of it because of their own founded experience. And maybe their meaning is the same as the one that that drew me, but maybe it's different. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because again, it's all about turning back to the unfolding of life to just make us aware of that we're part of this whole thing. And and you know, we can be a voice for something larger than ourselves yeah. by simply having the experience and, and recording it no that i don't think we're going to disagree on that one actually I'm, I'm happy about that thank you it's um i think what i was worried about was that you would or what i was worried about was a haiku that has maybe philosophical points in it rather than I mean, most people write fragment phrase. I'm not completely hung up on, on fragment phrase, but when people are writing that, sometimes there will be a fragment or a phrase that has one solid objective uh, object in it, followed by a thought process, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't feel that has a point in, a, 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 um, I don't think it has a place in the haiku we write today, although that appears, my opinion seems to be, um, or it, it appears that more and more people are writing haiku like that. Hmm. What would you call that post postmodern? Maybe I don't know, but um... it's interesting to say philosophy mm -hmm. and, and and bring that in because to a certain degree, there's no getting away from at least the perception of some kind of philosophical statement being made by a piece of poetry um it's so ingrained into the culture um you know it's funny i think about uh an old blues traveler's song the hook i don't know if you're familiar with it but the hook is this song that's all about i'm not singing about anything but you think i've got some vast wisdom to give to you because you're listening to my words Right. And so we, you really can't get away from that. But this is what I was saying about you. You said I have this thing and then I add thought to it. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly the point I'm getting at. If you're adding thought to it. Then you're, you know, you're, you're probably on the path of not really writing a haiku. You know, <laughs> maybe you yeah. should convert that now. And that's the thing. If you focus on the experience first. And you focus on. with veracity capturing that experience for yourself in in whatever words you're doing then the words become tools that you can arrange rearrange adjust cut and make it sure that what you're expressing there is keep in keeping with the idea you had for haiku in the first, or whatever you know perception of haiku that you have mm -hmm. so um 
let me give let me let me give a thought on this. So, for instance, like there's a you know there's a, a journal Whiptail journal oh, yeah. that is dedicated to the single line yes. of poetry and haiku and, and other forms as well. Um, with the kits and with the guide in terms of the any the instructions to write, mm -hmm. I do keep it in those a three line haiku. Yeah. Three line, free, you know, I, I do suggest the use of phrase and fragment because it's a good way to, to get started. Mm. But from that three, you know, after that process, then you have a three line haiku to work with, or perhaps it's a haiku, you'll work with it and see. Uh, but from that, then you have, you can revise it mm -hmm. anyway. So, you know, for instance, you know, with, with Whiptail, I'll often have, several haiku prepared in three lines and then okay well whip tails deadline's coming up I, I want to submit to that can i convert this three line haiku into a single line haiku and mm -hmm. and then i'm then i am involved in the mental process you know of, of breaking down haiku rules guidelines whatever to yeah. get me something that is publishable yeah but you're going to write a lot of haiku that never are going to see publication yes this is true. and that's great. That's fine. They can inform and teach you and take you further along the, your own path. And, and um, but again, it all goes back to that experience first thing. And, and I think that I'm, I'm informed in this because of how I learned to draw. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, I had struck, you know, I struggle with drawing as everybody I think does once you hit, you know, adolescence and you realize, Oh, there's people have ideas of what a drawing should look like and things like that. And one of the biggest uh, helpful things I came across in my learning to draw was that the brain will, if you're trying to draw, say, a face, the brain will get in your way because the brain will go, oh, okay, well, I know what a nose looks like. Let me draw a nose. And I know what this eye looks like. Let me draw an eye. And if you've named it and you're trying to draw it, you're not going to get it. You're, you're going you're gonna to end up with something that looks unnatural mm -hmm. because you're not actually drawing that person's face. You're drawing your idea of that person's face. Very similar to haiku. I can go into haiku and I can have an experience and I can write not about the experience, not about what I saw, felt, heard, thought, but about my interpretation of all that. Mm. You know, a pine tree means something to me personally. But if I get caught up in that too much, I'm not going to write a, an authentic haiku. I'm going to write a, a poem about a pine tree. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of the Harry Potter uh, podcast that I did, um, which, by the way, you can listen to if you go to ghostonvacay.com, right on the landing page, there's a link to the uh, to that podcast. But in that, Amanda, who was the co-host, who, as you said, was the haiku version, um, she said something that I thought was very to the point here. When we were talking about the Genesis kit, that was the first kit that I did. Yeah. And it's all about having an experience with an apple, right? And I... You know, and she she was unfamiliar with it when we did the podcast. I mean, she wanted to go in fresh. So I read through that that haiku kit and how it works. And her and her words were something along the lines of, "Well, that's interesting because I if you had sat me down and said write a poem about an apple, the first thing I would do is think about every experience I've had with an apple in the past. You know, think about apple pie. I think about fall. I think about blah blah blah. All those things that the concept of apple holds." But you're telling me don't do that. You're telling me take this one apple, take it somewhere, have an experience with it, and write that. Mm -hmm. And that's again part of it. And that's why I chose an apple for the first one too. It's such a universal symbol in a way. And you know, there's cultural things you can't you can't get away with, you mm -hmm. can't get away from, right? Uh, yeah, even the apple and all that. But an apple is only an apple, mm -hmm. or it's always an apple. And so having a real experience with an apple might be something different than you think it is. Yeah. Certainly was for me. I, uh, I, I took your advice. I went and bought my apple and I sat ah. and I, I held it and felt it and peeled it because I don't eat skin mm. and, so, and so on. I still haven't written anything particularly good, but I could really see where you were coming from with the process in order to do that. It was, um, right. It was really well, good. that's interesting you say that, Patricia, because I think one thing for, and there are mental disciplines, obviously. Mm -hmm. If you're going to write haiku, you, you got to 
you got to rein this thing in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the concept of did I write a haiku can be, or good, did, did I write a good haiku can be a dangerous concept. Uh, it's something that, uh, again, kind of drawing from visual art world, but um, uh, I had read a, a book uh, years and years ago that was, the, the essence of the book is why do so many people who go and get a master's of fine arts degree end up stop making art? <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he delved into quite a few things. One of the things he said is you have to create a bunch of bad art to have good art. You're going to have to write a bunch of bad haiku mm -hmm. to have good haiku, or at least if you're trying to take the haiku further down the road for yourself mm -hmm. um, and, and not just, again, write haiku that is recognizable as haiku, might be very fine haiku, but might not be really true to you. And, and you might miss some new thing that 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 haiku can uh, embrace yeah that's that's a very good point i mean when i think of it a bad haiku was probably the wrong way of putting it i mean yes they weren't particularly good but uh they didn't yet have my voice or the way uh, i wanted to write them yet so you know right. there's plenty in the notebook and something may well come out of it yet but um currently they've not got my voice they've not got yes. the way I write so I, I think that's good advice keep keep writing um because it takes it take also takes a while to find the way you want to write you know absolutely even within absolutely. the if you even if you know within the definitions whatever definition of haiku you're working with and there are many um you still have to find the one that you know the way you want to write within your chosen discipline and my my is my particular discipline is the one where I would I'm not going to count syllables because I think I've got to the stage where I sort of know in my in my gut where my where the limits are. But I yes. do want if I'm writing haiku as opposed to senru, I do want a season in there because I think the season uh, helps with the emotion. It helps. Mm. It helps with the interpretation because we generally all have a feeling about a season. If you you can take your season and you can choose your words about the season um, and the the idea of the season, and it can help your reader. It gives your reader a huge clue as to the tone of your poem, um, and so many other things. It, it, it's just a. I just for me the kigo is is essential and maybe not a huge cut but a bit of a cut so you, like i said mm. to you before I'm not, I'm not hung up on a total phrase fragment thing but i do want to hear a bit of a pause between ideas within the the poem so i wondered when you're doing your your kits what what advice are you giving if, if any on on haiku form well on haiku form in terms of uh, uh just addressing the form itself, I, I point out that um, as it's as it's practiced in English, which is the only way, the only thing I can speak to, mm -hmm. but as it's practiced and published in English now, there are certain frameworks of, of, um, of how it's, you know, written down and cuts, and, you know, everything you speak of there. Uh, but there's, there is not consensus across the board of all the different elements and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, the question of what is a haiku is not a question that you answer with words in a statement. Uh, it's what you discover for yourself as you write it and as you read it. And then you know, the, the, the culture will take care of that. What survives for posterity? That's not, none of us have control over that. All we can do is do our best from our understanding and then, and then let things fall as they may. But I would like to speak to seasonality because I think that's probably the one kind of concept where you and I maybe aren't, uh, you know, on the same necessarily on the same page um 
because for me, yes, I, I believe seasonality is very important to haiku as a general thing, uh, because it reflects what is very important in haiku, which is everything is transition. True. The only the only total non-changing state is death. <laughs> you know, if you're dead, nothing's gonna change for you. If you're alive, everything's gonna change for you, and there's no stopping that. Mm -hmm. Now with seasonality. It can reflect on that, that transience of all things, which is very important to the spirit of haiku, I feel. Uh, however, I think, again, we get caught up with the concept of season. And so, uh, for instance, leaves change color in the autumn. Do leaves change color because it's autumn? No. Leaves changing color is part of what is autumn. It is the manifestation of autumn. If we go back to, again, going out and having authentic experience and keeping to the moment, and that's very, of course, very important in haiku. It's of the moment. We write haiku in present tense because we're not writing about a past experience or a past event. We're, we're writing out an experience that we had in the moment. So if you are true to what's going on around you, seasonality will come through, through what's naturally going on. And, and then seasonality becomes part and parcel to that, that authenticity of that experience, if it's part of that experience. Okay. It's, Gonna have to think I think a key one. factor, a key <laughs> factor for what I, and particularly when I talk about the foraging factor, Mm -hmm. because i think again the foraging factor is important because that's where that's the the tipping point that's the the point at which you can get out and get past your concepts and just focus on what is going on if you go out and say okay it's it's autumn i'm going to go write an autumn haiku well you've already limited yourself uh and already and you're already focusing your mind in a way that might not capture what's actually out there but if you just go out there and say, okay, I'm going to write about what's going on. If the autumn is manifesting in a way that's meaningful to you at that moment, it will come through. You don't have to force it. Um, and, you know, certain haiku experiences aren't necessarily seasonally uh, uh, driven. Um, yes, the history and culture of haiku makes it very important. But at the same time, there are many haiku that are quite authentic and, and, and just as insightful uh, for, for the experience that seasonality might be in the background, might not be really what uh, what's coming front and center. But it, if it's of the moment, then it's of the moment. And, you know, the world as it is right now and the way we communicate, um, you know, the seasonality that comes out of Japanese haiku, well, it... Japan has a very particular climate. And so everybody experiencing haiku in Japan and particularly back in the period where Japan was isolationist and of its own, they were, you know, when they say autumn, they knew what autumn felt like for where they were. And so do we. But if someone in Australia is reading, you know, haiku I wrote, their, you know, their experience autumn might be different. And so if I just use autumn as a concept and put it out there, you know, winter day or, or something like that, yeah. that may or may not have, have resonance, you know, but, but again, if I'm capturing the manifestation of that autumn as it occurs, then it's going to have uh, built in authenticity because it's, it's a real thing going on right now. Well, I think that's a better way to look at it actually, um, rather than forcing <laughs> the issue on, you know, as you said, um, just writing about an autumn day because you're not really offering any anything to somebody who has no idea what an autumn day in Switzerland would look like. It's got to it's to be more authentic. It's I've got to give you something to hang on to rather than just mm -hmm. give you an autumn day. It's meaningless. We recently spent a bit of time with Janice Doppler talking about Zoka. Yes. And I know you've been thinking a little bit about Zoka too. 
And I wondered, does this reflect? Is this reflected in your work in Ghosts on Vacay? Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us, tell us about it. Well, this goes back to my my original statement where I said there's a thing, there's something that's not a thing, but it's behind everything that is. <laughs> Zoka is a good word for that, um, but it's not all inclusive. It's the great mystery, I think, and this is uh, this is. This is what drives me for haiku and really gets me excited when I'm when I'm, you know, dealing with haiku because there's some something goes on in the unfolding of the universe that we don't really understand. And then this is what I as I said, we can't put it in a box. Okay. Consciousness. Just if you if you strip everything away and just say, let's talk about consciousness. Well, we don't know what where consciousness comes from. We don't know even all its mechanics of how it works. We don't know why in a particular experience feels like a particular experience. Um, you know, I do a little bit of uh, light science reading on on the side as well. Uh, but when you start looking at everything where humanity is looking at from quantum physics all the way through, you know, psychology, philosophy, all of it, you know, there is natural law, universal law, something going on. Maybe it's God. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but I know there's something there because I can experience it directly. I know that there is something about consciousness that makes an apple this particular apple in my hand have a feel and, and and it feels like something but i don't know where that comes from and maintaining that i don't know mind is very helpful for i could you met my husband at uh haiku north america it's a good job we didn't yeah. have this discussion <laughs> <laughs> with him. he's a uh, very much a uh well he he's an, a physics physicist by education although that doesn't preclude oh. you from writing haiku but he would um he would have given he would have given us a hard time for that sort of statement <laughs> <laughs> god love him yeah um well, I, i'll tell you another kind of hint mm -hmm. my mindset towards this um it, it it came from uh, uh, quite a, quite a few years back. I was reading and talking with my wife about uh, there was there was a man who uh, I think it was upstate New York or maybe Maine. I can't remember exactly, but he disappeared and disappeared into the woods and, and for like twenty years was living and did not see another human being. And he was surviving by robbing summer cabins and things like this. And he finally got caught thrown in jail oh. uh, uh but when some and and a writer went and talked to him about his experience uh and he said that what out in the woods totally by himself what he learned was it was more important to have the experience than to attempt to understand the experience and that really hooked me you know so uh, there is a, you know, there are concepts in, in, in Eastern thought of don't check yourself. Mm -hmm. Keep, I don't, I don't know mind going and, and don't check yourself and just allow the natural processes, allow who, allow what you are to, to guide that. Because we, you know, what we are, you know, we, we have a brain and that brain is designed to take in sensory input and to hold on to memory and thought and, and process. And it's observable. It's something you can observe. But once you start putting on belief and concept and all this, you tend to try to direct that instead of just experiencing it. Okay. So did that answer the question? I'm not sure. I think so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, the question is, is way back in my mind now because I'm thinking about so many other things as we go. <laughs> well you know i think a lot of times questions are best left just as questions and the answer yeah. allowed to come mm -hmm. whenever it comes as and when 
absolutely. Another question. Hmm. Way back, I suppose, when you're thinking about the the beat poets and their how they've influenced the journey of of haiku, hmm. I think it was fair to say, probably fair to say, around about that time, and going maybe 10, 15 years after that, that Zen, the the idea of Zen and the influence of Zen um, was quite strong in haiku. Where are you on that scale? How does that influence you and how has that influenced what you put together in your kits? I'm kind of hoping this would come up because <laughs> I was ready for it. <laughs> okay. I've got a prepared statement for that. Okay, right. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So we have Zen. Mm -hmm. and we have haiku. Mm -hmm. So what can we say about them just as they are? Both evolved in Japan during the same period of history. Both are concerned with experience just as it is, not as we conceive it to be, not as we want it to be, and not as we think it should be. Mm -hmm. And the practice of both calls for placing one's attention on the present moment and only the present moment. Now, both have now spread to cultures throughout the world and have undergone the translations and interpretations and everything else that that inevitably brings. But long story short, I don't know, and I intend to keep not knowing. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I think it's the only answer that I wouldn't get hit by a Zen master for giving <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough the influence of western education yeah on the development of haiku would you care to say something about that yes it's a it's an unfortunate thing <laughs> <laughs> so there's a word that we don't use in the haiku co community uh and it's appropriation mm -hmm. and it's a dangerous word as you know, mm -hmm. I think the difficulties that we have inherited because of how Western education works in general and how it's impacted haiku, um, you can get in this attitude of like, well, the pure haiku is, is, is a Japanese aesthetic haiku. Hmm? That presupposes that you understand the culture that came from. Mm. And for most of us, we don't. True. And then also, there is a, there was a certain arrogance in how the Japanese culture was viewed and, and, and how haiku was brought in that almost immediately it was, oh, well, here's an interesting poetry form the Japanese are doing. How do we westernize it? Mm -hmm. Or how do we interpret it through the Western lens? Yeah. instead of letting it speak for itself. And so, you know, it's like looking at it from a Western lens, Western education tries to take everything and kind of distill it into little sound bites, right? Yeah. Little things. And so the idea that like, even in that era, like everybody had the same idea what haiku was, that these kind of conversations weren't going on when it was being written. Well, we know that's not true. I mean, we know Basho, you know, was a bit of a revolutionary and stepped away from um stepped away from being you know uh in the urban center and and making his living out of judging other people's haiku and and rewriting haiku and he left all that and went and lived a simpler yeah life so that he could follow the way of haiku the way he saw it yeah um yeah and then you know the whole conversation that comes up around 575 because 575 haiku was used as a tool to teach children about syllables and, and then the form becomes more important than the content and it should never be that um you know i did want to i want to address real quick after uh oh, i can't remember which podcast it was but after uh podcast that we had uh there was the question of does does form uh, reduce creativity or does, does mm. it, you know the question I'm talking about, you, yeah, you had yeah. sent it out to the group. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, does an idea of form restrict your creativity? 
gosh, I hope so. Because, <laughs> you know, creativity is this rampant force that will just go out and do everything, you know? And yeah, it, it, for any person who's creative who wants to end up with a, something that's consumable by someone else, that, that'll actually make sense to somebody else, you have to limit your creativity. And that's part of what is the use and usefulness of the form because it, it it forces you to focus in instead of just doing whatever the hell you feel like you know yeah uh, that's that's something i'm i'm tackling right right at this moment just to, well the first thing is looking at how haiku came to us and into into the west and as you say we've n we've never really addressed this sort of appropriation um issue might have to look at that one well, yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting that so often that uh, you know the station of the metro is held up as the first mm -hmm. haiku written in English when you know a Japanese poet in San Francisco had written and published English haiku that he wrote before that was ever published, and and quite frank, you know, quite frankly, it, it's it might have influenced uh, Elliot. Ezra Pound was quite influenced by French I'm free verse. Pound. Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I said earlier. That's okay. <laughs> um, he was quite interested, and I don't know enough about Ezra Pound, uh, the man. Um, I suspect he was from a relatively wealthy family if he was toddling around Europe, talking to, to you know, staying in England, staying in the uh, in France. So yes, he spent a lot of time thinking and talking about free verse, and free verse, came, uh, or rather his station in the metro came had some somewhat to do with free verse and his inkling of haiku so i must go back and see how he put those two together his knowledge of mm. haiku and, and anyway as an editor i i can immediately spot the person who has not made the transition from western poetry to a haiku frame you know frame of mind what advice would you give to that poet, that one who's not made the switch yet? Uh, my advice, first of all, would be to daily, let's put a number on it, daily read five haiku mm -hmm. from various sources uh, and write one haiku mm -hmm. at least a day and do that for let's say a hundred days. Mm -hmm. That's a good start. Yeah. And then readdress the question. It goes back to what I just, you know, I said earlier, it's okay to leave a question as a question and then let the answer unfold. Yeah. And that, you know, you learn haiku by the experiencing of haiku. Now, and that's one thing, I guess, also is is part of the dna of ghost on vacay and, and on the field guide i'm working on mm -hmm. um when i say haiku what do i mean mm -hmm. and the, and and really that's the whole complexity and difficulty of language right you know there's a thing and i give it a name and now i'm stuck with that name for that thing <laughs> actually kind of paraphrasing George Carlin here, but, you know, I have a thought, I put a name, a, a, a word to it, and now I'm stuck with that word for that thought. Um, when I talk of haiku, yes, I mean the three lines, one line, two lines, whatever you get, you know, as a poem when you're done. But I'm also ta just talking about the experience. You know, I, I, I often felt when I, you know, as I got into haiku more, uh, that I've been experiencing haiku my whole life. Going out in the woods was a big thing, you know, and I experienced haiku my whole life. I only learned how to write it down after about 40 years of experiencing it. So, um, in fact, I want to, if you don't mind, I want to share a little story on that because I think it's, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, informative. Mm -hmm. When I was a child of about seven or so, um, and we were on a visit, to Warren, Pennsylvania, where my dad was from. And this was like about three years after his dad had died. Mm -hmm. And my dad was about 37 at the time. And he took me hiking. And this is, you know, my dad spent his youth rambling all over the mountains in this, in this area. 
So he took me hiking and we were up the trail and we came to a place where we were a fallen log there. And he said, sometimes when you're in the woods, you need to just sit down and be quiet and see what happens. And so we sat down and for a while, nothing happened. And, you know, as an adult looking back, I think he probably was thinking about his father and thinking about the loss of his father. Now he has his young son that he's trying to instill something in. And then we were sitting on a, a ridge with a little stream valley down below us. And on the opposite side of the ridge, a bear came walking out. Oh. And the bear didn't know we were there. The wind was blowing in our faces. So the bear had no idea. And suddenly everything went away. The only, you know, my experience, everything went away. The only thing that ma mattered was that bear and seeing what that bear was doing in its natural environment without any awareness that we were around. That was the start for me. That was the very beginning of this journey that the bear itself has its reality and its meaning, and it is as part of the life that's unfolding as I am, or I am as part of as much a part of the life unfolding here as it is. And at the core of my identity is nature. And that's something we haven't talked about yet, is nature. You know, when you say a haiku is a nature poem, right? Well, what do you mean? And what is nature? And that's something I've worked with whether I've been painting, writing, acting, what is nature, you know? And, and, you know, a puddle in your backyard is as natural as the ocean is. And, and a weed growing in your flower bed is nature manifesting itself. Mm -hmm. And your observation of something going on is nature too. We can't escape, I, well, again, philosophy, right? But I feel we cannot escape from the fact that we came from the exact processes that that bear came from, or the exact process that this rock came from. We're all atoms. We're all energy. And what we are always changes even our physicality. Every atom I have in my body is not the same atom that little boy had. It's all different. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my life moving around. Uh, I don't, I never, up until we moved here to Wilmington, I had never lived in any one place for uh, any one home or in even regions for more than say three, four years. I've been here now for going on 12 years. And I am very much of this place now both reality wise, because I have all the atoms I have have been drawn from all the atoms that are around here. And, uh, and the air I breathe is the same air that's informing everything that's going on around me. So, so now I, I, you know, I feel I'm grounded in the reality of my environment here and it allows me to explore it with freedom. I'm just going to, we should, we should wrap up shortly because i thought that your story was a great place to stop but now you've moved on and i'm going to tackle you on one more thing before we before we sure. sort of head to the end you talk about nature and mm -hmm. you've opened up a whole thing that we we cannot do today because we would be here for hours Understood. is haiku mm -hmm. a nature po poem or is it not and i think this ties back to what you were talking about when we touched on seasonality you talked about seasonality being transience. And maybe haiku is really all about, and maybe this is why I love the idea of this, the, the season and the seasonality in the haiku. Maybe haiku is actually about transience. And that might, because we have in the past, we have tried to tackle where does humanity come Mm. Into, into the haiku and writing about ur urban life and humans where where does that come within the form and maybe that come that that solves that particular issue if we think about haiku as being about transience we're transient 
our lives yes. are transient our thoughts our processes you know um my hair color it's all transient you know it's uh yes. it's maybe that's how we, we look at it but we'll have to come back and discuss that yes the day, I think. Mm -hmm. um so craig i think you've answered my question solidly we've spoken mm -hmm. about ghosts on vacay but have we missed anything that is particularly important to you um about ghosts on vacay um well yeah just a couple of things um mm -hmm. the the website of uh, Ghost on VK, uh, as I said, it has three haiku creation kits on there right now mm -hmm. that uh, you can download as a PDF and try. It also has some um, blog entries that, mm -hmm. you know, deal with the this exploration. But uh, everything I'm doing in, in the book that I'm, I'm pulling together is is very, very focused on taking what, again, is going on with me day by day and 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 using that as the source for um uh what's going into the field guide the the i guess the thing to realize is i'm i am not dealing in these things with the history of haiku i'm not dealing with you know broad philosophical ideas about haiku there is plenty you know uh, i point people to the haiku foundation i point people to this podcast i, I point people to where with our totally interconnected age there is everything you ever want to read about but again, I'm I'm just set that aside for now and just go out and experience it. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm doing. And uh something I hope to add also this year, uh, before the uh before the end of the year is a uh, a little audio journal that I'm gonna do on a irregular basis. Uh that will be called um Basho Hurt a Frog, <laughs> uh, which relates back to the stickers I had for the uh conference. Uh but it is going to be uh, focused on the sound of haiku pretty much solely so the uh again the idea that haiku itself has some musicality to it and some rhythm to it and obviously the choice of a line break or do i use punctuation or not all, all that stuff impacts how that those words flow and and sometimes i think it's something we don't necessarily pay enough attention to uh so i'll be working you know i'll be reaching out to other haiku poets with you know something i feel is particularly interesting in the way that they've sounded out their haiku and and we'll explore that just from from the sound factor of it so i'm kind of looking forward to that side of it too before we finish you you just you mentioned your little stickers you had at the conference yes but maybe you should tell us a little bit about the artwork that goes with ghosts on vacay yeah, so can we see that? Yes. Is that reversed? No, it says Basho heard a frog and made of his mind a pond. Yes. yes. So this was, you know, when you go to a haiku conference, you, you have to have things to give out and share mm. with people. So this was a sticker I made for, for the conference. Uh the it's simple line drawing that I did of the of the frog. <laughs> and uh this this referred back to um Something I, I uh, it was actually a little video by a Japanese um, educator about the writing of the old pond. And we actually have a record of how that haiku was written. Uh, one of his Fausto students was present when it was written and he wrote out how that experience laid down. And the point with that, and it's a very interesting one, is that when Basho wrote the old old pond, he was did not was not standing in front of an old pond. He was sitting with his students, and they heard the frogs. And the old pond existed in his head, mm -hmm. and really is there as a metaphor of of the mind in, in, in some ways. So that what the sound of water was what brought the frog into his mind. And so the old pond becomes the mind and the sound of the frog becomes what brings the frog into that mind. That's one interpretation of it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm very much a, a, a Basho devotee, but I also you know embrace Santoka and, and other uh, later masters and I love Isa. 
but the thing about Basho is his his constant pointing out to go out and get your own experience. Hmm. You know, don't emulate me. Don't emulate yeah, yeah. me. Go out and get your own experience. And that's that's the message I, I received from Basha. Hence Ghost on Vacay and the process yeah. that you go yes. through. Yes. Well, Craig, that's probably a good good place definitely to stop and uh just that's remind it. people to go to the show notes, get hold of your website there and go and get the freebies go and go and get the freebies because they're going to help you to write better yes. hiking. and uh, i wish everybody wonderful experiences and meaningful experiences and i'm i'm guessing that you'd like some feedback too uh, when people have used your your sheets always hope always helpful to get field uh, uh feedback on it you know all of these uh, all these haiku kits have been extensively field tested by me but I would love to hear uh, other people's experiences with it. Yeah, every every kit that I've done is, is an experience that I've worked through myself. And and uh, again, so that you can have some experience without having to worry about filtering your brain out too much. <laughs> well, if I ever get that Apple haiku that I feel is publishable, I shall send it to you first, Craig. And, uh, oh, I appreciate that. I'd love to see it. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't sort of hang about waiting on it though because it's <laughs> my, my current Things efforts take as long as they take <laughs> <laughs> this is very true so craig thank you very much it was definitely worth the wait well for me anyway it was definitely oh, worth very, the wait. very much for me too thank you okay and um i think people will enjoy the kits so i encourage them to go to the website have a look at ours get the website details go and visit craig and let Great. him know what you think and perhaps send him the odd poem to let him know that you've used his kit too. Thank you, Craig. You're welcome. Wow. I loved chatting to Craig. He's given me so much to think about. And of course, I still have to create that Apple haiku. At least one I'm happy with. Do go over to his website. Check out the resources there. Link, as I so often say, in the show notes. I wanted to remind you, as Craig and I touched on it in our conversation, that this year on Poetry P, we'll be looking at how haiku came to the West, from a bilingual perspective. In episodes four and five of this seventh series, we looked at haiku from the German language. Obviously, the podcasts are mostly in the English language, don't worry. We'll continue this theme and weave it into the episodes this year. We'll be looking at how haiku developed in many Western languages, including, of course, my own English. Now, Craig mentioned a haiku written by a Japanese chap, which purports to be the first haiku written in English. It's by Yoni Noguchi, and it appears in his novel, The American Diary of a Japanese Girl, which was published in 1902. It was a novel written in the guise of an autobiography. The haiku, in case you're interested, was this. Remain, oh remain, my grief of sayonara, there in the water sound. Remain, oh remain, my grief of sayonara, there in the water sound. Now, I can't dispute whether this was the first one or not. I haven't done the research. But if anyone would like to disagree, please do. But send me the evidence. Well, thanks again to Craig for spending time with us today. And thank you for joining me and watching or listening. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, please do give a review to the podcast wherever you get yours. Or you can comment on YouTube. And if you'd be so kind, spread the word via your social media. And maybe you could sponsor us with a membership or a coffee. I would be eternally grateful for all or any of the above. And one last reminder to check out the submission diary. So until next time, keep writing. And of course, there are lots of bits and bobs in the show notes this time. If I've forgotten anything, you know the score. Email me. Ciao.